Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first episode on the channel called The Overcomers. You know me, I'm M. So I I decided along the way as you guys been in this journey with me for the past two years and I've just been trying to drop knowledge to you guys, me and my co-hosts and all the other people I bring on board to make you live a more fulfilling life, to make better decisions so that you don't complain about why am I here. Listen, we're here to give you the information and some of you may not like it. That means you have to look at yourself, but that's what you need to do. In order to make that change, you have to change yourself. So this particular podcast is dealing with true overcomers. And to light, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to meet a young lady who is a true, true overcomer. And I'm going to let her tell you the story. This is about me bringing somebody in who has gone through some of the most horrific things you could even imagine and came out on the other side, became better and, and have a and living with a purpose. So tonight, I want to introduce you to Mrs. Crystal Gonzalez. And her story, if you're a parent, will touch you in your heart. Um, we as parents always want to do the best for our kids. We try to make sure we give them the best possible, best education, living situations, everything. And sometimes that ain't even good enough because sometimes the outside force becomes your, it gets in your world and changes your world drastically. And so at this moment, I'm going to pass you on to Mrs. Crystal Gonzalez and let her tell you her overcoming story. Miss Crystal, how are you doing, love? Hi, here. I am doing okay. Oh, my gosh. You said so, so many truthful, um, wonderful words, kind words. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be a part of your Overcomers series. This is, this is absolutely amazing. Um, and to even be in this space and say that to you. And I know you want me to get into the story, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. I feel like with us sharing our experiences is the only way that we can um, educate one of another, bring awareness and, and make positive changes or change for the better, you know? And so, um, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, love. Like I said, it's you, you know, of course, she, the backstory is she worked a lot of years with, with my wife and, mm -hmm. um, no, hard working lady, you know, got beautiful kids, you know, working her butt off, just trying to take care of the kids, as a lot of you guys are. You know, you're working your butt off, you're trying to balance everything, try to do the best you can to to just give your kids that opportunity to survive in this world. Because all, all your kids really have is you. Mm -hmm. Forget about your the family and friends and all that stuff. It's really you. It starts with you. Don't blame the churches, don't blame the schools. It's you. You have to take responsibility as parents to raise your kids the proper way and find resources out there. So don't just throw them out in the streets because the streets will eat them up and spit them out. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're not benefiting from we're, be, we're not benefiting from good parenthood. We're benefiting right. from bad parenthood, very right. bad, bad parenting decisions. And they are costing our kids with their their mental abilities, their, their social abilities and just how they actually deal with life. And if you can't teach them how to deal with life, society does not care. Society will rather put a stamp on your kid and send them to the next prison and they'll be part of the prison uh, complex for the rest of their lives. They don't care. So with Ms. Crystal, she has a very unique story. And, and let me just bring up a one one particular thing that I, I was doing some research, which is disturbing. Um, in the past three years, the number one cause of death between for kids between one and 19 is gun violence. That's right. Here in America. It's, it's, Crystal, that's it's, sad. It's we're not, not a, we're not talking about drugs. We're not talking about, uh, Illness. accidents mm -hmm. something right. preventable it's like that's crazy mm -hmm. to me and it you is. have to deal with this firsthand which is firsthand. disturbing absolutely now you mentioned something from the very beginning i don't want to skate past that 
You know, we talk about raising our children, making a conscious, intelligent decision to have a baby, right? Because you did that. That's something that you decided that you wanted to do. But I knew right away with my upbringing, myself, because I I pretty much raised myself and I knew that wasn't it. So I knew right away, I am my children's first teacher, right? They need to learn from me before they even enter the school. I knew that I had to instill with them morals, values. I had to instill with the, in, into them discipline, um, right and wrong. I had to instill those things to my children before I sent them out into the world. That was my job, right? And unfortunately, like you said, there are a lot of parents who aren't available to that capacity to their children. And I, I know for a number of reasons, you know, there, there, there can be any amount of things that, that can um, deter or kind of like hold people from doing, quote unquote, their job. But um, the fact remains that your children are learning, whether passively, indirectly, they are learning, they are watching, and they're picking up things and it's being downloaded and programmed whether you are actively doing it or not, right? And so mm-hmm. we we live in a world right now where we're seeing nothing but death and destruction. We're seeing a lot of glorification of um, the very things that are killing us, right? Where you have uh, certain lyrics and rap music and you you know, you know hear oftentimes rappers going to jail because they're, they're telling about the murders they committed on their songs. And I don't know how intelligent that is, but, you know, it's happened more than once, you know, and then you have, you know, some artists swallowing pills, right? Because they don't want to get caught with um, with any kind of drugs or anything like that. And so they're, they're, they're losing their lives for something that is preventable. You know, they're perpetuating this lifestyle that is doing nothing but killing us. It's killing us. There's no other way to describe it. That is so true, Crystal, because I was just talking to my, to my wife uh, last week, and we were listening to the radio, and I swear, Crystal, I, and again, I, I'm open to all music, but I'm a mature person. You're mature. So mm-hmm. there's certain things that we will listen to that mm-hmm. I would want my, if I had a five-year-old, six-year-old listening to. Mm-hmm. That line has been blurred because now all you hear is, I'm going to say garbage music, throwaway right. music. And you'll say, oh, I want to say that. And you turn on something else. We'll turn on something that we used to listen to that's, mm-hmm. that's not as vo- vulgar and vulgar. As bad as this, this that's the word. garbage is. Right. But I, I literally seen it, been in a car, been in a car, pulled beside someone, and they have the nastiest music. And I'm, I'm just going to name them Cardi mm-hmm. B, Little Red, uh, uh, Megan Thee Stallion. And there's a mother that's mm-hmm. blowing that music up. And there's a daughter beside her know every lyric yeah. in the song. Mm-hmm. and this is not the edited version this is the mm-hmm. unedited version and mm-hmm. they're just in the car going back and forth and i'm like oh my god you already set this baby up for failure already because that is that's poisonous music mm-hmm. and as an adult you say you know what this is not the time or place for my kid to listen to this if i have to listen to this i'll listen to it out when she's not in the car but these parents are now trying to be their friends and you need to be their guardian. You're the ones who's supposed to keep them out of situations that can get them jacked up. And not to mention the little girls who are walking around almost with thongs on at mm-hmm. age 11, 12, 13. I'm like, and y'all are not ready for that attention. But the mothers and fathers who are supposed to be there are just kind of like, oh, that's the way things are. Mm-hmm. But that, me- that stuff is killing them. It's, it's you're setting them up for failure mm-hmm. and to get them in situations that they're not ready for. And then when it happens, oh my God, I don't know what happened. What, what, you did, you happened. You That's didn't a- take care of your responsibility. You didn't sit there and been the guiding force for that kid. Mm-hmm. And when the kid goes out there and does something crazy or gets pregnant or shoots someone, and now all of a sudden, I can't believe Lil Ray Ray shot someone. Well, yeah, Lil Ray was going to shoot somebody. But what was he not going to do? I mean, mm-hmm. that's all you taught him. And he was around the, the the violence, the drugs, the music, the images. You have to control it as a parent, but you just can't say, "Oh, kids be kids," and then something happens, and then all of a sudden, not my kid. I can't believe my kid. No, it was your kid, and you're the problem. You're the reason why it happened. Mm-hmm. Take responsibility for that. And so again, what we're talking about is the situation that that you got yourself in. 
it's totally avoidable. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about something, you know what, it just happened. No, 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 no. It was a series of bad decisions along the way. And it didn't, it wasn't over weeks or months, over years. Over years. That's that right. Put you in that situation. And again, you're doing everything you can on your side to raise your kids properly, mm -hmm. to make sure that you, you, you're showing a different way. You're saying, I know I wasn't brought up this way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do something differently. That's and right. you decide to do something differently. And I always say in my other podcast, I said, you guys, when you, when your parents raise you, they, they do the best they can, mm -hmm. especially if they give you all the, the good advice. You may not like, you may not even want to hear it, but at least you're giving them an advice that, you know, it's going to make them say, okay, my mama did tell me this and you make your own decisions. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes you look at some parents, you're like, you know what? My mama did a horrible job mm -hmm. and I know she did a horrible job. So what I tell people to do is if you're in that situation, unfuck your mind, mm -hmm. sit back and say, what are the things you want to change? What are the things I don't like? And then you have to be an adult because at this point you're 18, you're an adult. You can make your own decisions. Your mama may not like it. It doesn't matter because you have to live your life. Mm -hmm. So you have to make that decision to change your life so you don't end up like her or him. So that way your kids can see, that, oh, mama came a long way because my grandmama, because you're going to have to introduce them. Your grandmama act a certain way, but my mom don't act that way. And you mm -hmm. make it clear to your kids, yes, your grandmama was, is who she is. Mm -hmm. I am who I am. I made a conscious decision to make changes to make sure yeah. that you become better. It's, it's building a foundation. You have to build a foundation in order to get to where you need to get to. And that's where we're failing as as a community, as a society. You're mm -hmm. you're basically banking on these kids not to be thriving, not to be successful, and you're making it seems cool seem cool to go to jail or to take mm -hmm. drugs or you know to do all these crazy things out here like with no repercussions. But there are repercussions. There's long term repercussions for bad decisions, and we just want people to just own up to it. Just Become the people you want to be. You don't have to say, oh, I was raised in South Baltimore. I was raised in New York. I was raised on the streets of Oakland. And that's who I am. No, mm -hmm. that's the situation in which you were born. It's up to you to get you out of that situation and to a better situation. And nobody's going to help you. And ladies and gentlemen, the world does not care about you. Your, you care about your kids. You should be the one that's taking care of your kids. You should be the one guiding your kids. You should be the one making decisions, the hard decisions. Because if you don't, then we as a society pay for your bad decisions. And again, we, I don't want to hear about our work. Uh, I got two jobs, three jobs. This is what happens when you have kids. Mm -hmm. You have kids, you have to make sure that, hey, I'm doing right by them. And you have to, because if not, Society is going to put them in a situation that you can be putting money on their books or you go into their grave and dropping flowers on there talking about, oh, I wish I had done better. Mm -hmm. We don't want that to happen. There's too many women in a, in a sorority that you're in. That's in right. That's a sorority. <laughs> I don't want any women, any mother, any father to be in mm -hmm. because that's a sorority and fraternity that it is at the end. You either going to learn a lesson from that and do better, or mm -hmm. you're just going to crumble right there. So, and this is why I had Miss Crystal here because she's gone through things. She's gone through that right. firsthand, right. and there's a lot of mothers out there have gone through this exact same thing. And understand this, people. You know when you hear all this horrible stuff that comes on TV, like oh, five people got shot, one dead. Oh, let's go to the, let's go to the weather. Oh, uh, five people got killed, two people got shot. Oh, let's go to sports, and that's where it ends for people who are watching the news. Mm -hmm. It doesn't end for the mothers and fathers who lose sons and daughters. So you have to understand a long term re repercussion from that. So right. that's what we're trying to tell you. This this no this is not fun and games. It's never been fun and games. It's never going to be fun and games. But if you do not protect your kids from what's going on out here, the next thirty years is going to be unimaginable, and it's not going to be good for it us as a community and society at large. Right. Right. You, you said a mouthful and I would be remiss if I did not talk about some of the issues that we're seeing today. You know, we talk about juvenile crime. We talk about the young people. We talk about the youth. We talk about the music. Um, what people I don't want to ever miss is that the generation of children right now are being raised by my generation of mothers and fathers 
who are a product of the crack era in the 80s. So when we talk about things being downloaded and learned, most of those parents weren't available to us. I will tell you, there have been many times when my mother would leave us for months. I'm the oldest of five and I raised my brothers and sisters, right? Months? For months. And I made sure I cooked for them. I fed them. I made sure they took baths and sent them out to school. And I kept us all together because I did not want us to be separated if anybody were ever to find out what was happening home, right? So keep that in mind. So now you have a generation of us who have experienced lack and neglect and not really know. Because I tell you before, I raised myself. So now you have parents who can't be available to their children who are now out here. You see, I have Mm -hmm. to step it back because this is a decades long problem. Even when I think about my situation, my situation was an effect. It wasn't a cause, right? Mm -hmm. There's causes there that, that go back. So even what we're seeing today, now you have the effects again. When we talk about music, well, music has always been risque. Mm-hmm. Go back to some of the lyrics. Sometimes I'm listening. I'm like, I've been singing this song. My mom was singing a long time ago. Oh my God. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That's true. It's always been out there. And I think right now what's happening is when you open up the floodgates for um, the no sensory when it comes to the, the videos that's being played, the lyrics that are out there. We used to have things in place for that, but now you, you argue the freedom of speech. And now look what happens. Now you have a generation that just wants to outdo the last one. So somebody got to goggle something. Somebody need to take this off. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Somebody And nobody is singing about love and respect. And no, nobody's doing any of that, right? So no. now we want our kids to be fluffy. Yes, yes. How you want them to be affectionate and fluffy when all they hear is bang that girl and blah, 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 and I'm going to shoot them up. Like, this is what we hear. Here's the thing I want to always point out because we want to go back to the children when we're not understanding and not holding accountable. Uh, these are grown ass adults that are putting the music out there for us to consume. Absolutely. And children, again, are learning. They are children. Yes. <laughs> they are yes. learning, right? And so they're doing exactly what children do. They are sponges and they are learning. So now we got to hold them accountable because they're programming the video games. Mm -hmm. I don't know one seven-year-old that knows how to code Fortnite. (laughs) That's true. Right? I don't know any 10-year-olds who know how to code Grand Theft Auto and some of these other things that these children are getting a hold of. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Among us. You know, when I hear sometimes my son talk about some of these games, I'm just like, man, you know what? It's it's out there and it's so easy to access and it's so mm-hmm. popular. So yes. these are grown adults that are putting these products out there for us to consume. So it's a it's a it's it's hard to um it is hard to raise children. I think it's hard to raise children in any generation. Right now, what we're seeing is that there needs to be um more more um, sensors when it comes to the things that are being put out into the market. Um, I tell you this, Malcolm, I could be watching a Nickelodeon show with my son. Mm-hmm. Very next scene on a commercial, you got two guys kissing. Now, I'm not <laughs> here to condemn anybody, but why are you forcing these images to children? Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is crazy. And it, it's all the time. It's all the time. They are putting these things out there for them to pick up. You go into Target. There's, t- you got a whole month for LGBTQ plus. D- like, that doesn't make any sense. But you're forcing these things out to our children. So, you know, I can go on and on. I'm not here to to bash anybody's lifestyle. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm saying is that whatever you choose to consume in your own home, that's your business. And right now, when we talk about the music industry, the children um, out here just running rampant and just doing all kinds of stuff. Like Mm -hmm. I've never seen this before in my life. And I think about the city of Baltimore and crime being up 200 percent this year than it was last year. Come on, Chris. You got to be kidding. 200%. But you don't hear that. You don't hear, you hear, oh, it's coming down. It's, it's, it's less than this part, but you never hear that. This is stuff that 
-hmm. they, they don't want, it's almost like nobody wants you to really know what's going on. Because politically it's not a good look. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just the bottom line. Anybody can play around with numbers, you know, especially when I think about crime being down and, you know, I'm a victim of a violent crime. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that, I suppose, um, mm -hmm. in a little bit, but, um, anybody can do anything with numbers because are you actually reporting all the crimes that it, no, no, absolutely. You're not. And, think about, and think about it, Chris, how many people even go to the police mm -hmm. if it's like That's something right. happened to them? Because again, unfortunately, right. but the way it is, people don't trust police and rightfully so, because again, I'm, I'm. I'm that person who's like, if you, if I hire someone to be a police officer, I expect you to do your job. I don't expect you to, to harass anybody unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. If they're doing crime, handle your business. But just mm -hmm. don't go out to harassing people for the sake of harassing people. So mm -hmm. now people don't feel comfortable going to you because they're like, if they're out here beating me out in the streets, That's why right. would I come to them and say, hey, this happened to me or this happened to my family? Because what are they going to do? Because the mm -hmm. other question is that I would love to know, what's the rate of them solving these, these crimes? Yeah, oh my God. committed. No, that's that's the biggest issue is that even if they did um there was a crime committed, the rate of them actually catching a perpetrator or prosecuting a perpetrator is so low that people again, I'm I'm one of them. <laughs> that that is one of the biggest frustrations for victims of violent crimes is that you haven't even caught the perpetrator. And so people are left in limbo trying to figure out their lives and 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 is there a trial? Is it going to be a trial? Is my did this? It has to stop. It has to stop. Wow, that oh. is so crazy. Because you're right. We don't think about that. You mm -hmm. just think of the crime. You think hopefully somebody gets caught. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the numbers, the numbers say, well, only eight percent or ten percent getting caught. Well, well that means right. the other nine percent out there still committing crimes. That's correct. And it's putting everybody else at risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, we have to really look at everything that we're currently doing. The thing we used Absolutely. to do in the past doesn't work anymore. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a different world. And mm -hmm. that's the other thing that bothers me is we keep talking, well, we've been doing this for 10, 15, 20 years. Things have changed in the past 10, back so, in the past 10 years, things have yeah. changed. So and you, you have to be aware enough to say that the, these things are changing. We have to spend the time to see what has changed and how we can, you know, change things to go along with the flow with the, the, the change with the change. Ex exactly. change with the change and i tell you that's my motto and i and i say that because now i'll go ahead and give you all just a, a background why why i'm even sitting here talking to you today um so july 1st of 2023 just last year um i have my 18 year old daughter with me she had just graduated high school three weeks earlier, um, when I think about my daughter, I think about just how incredibly talented she was. Uh, she was a straight A student. She was so, she was, oh my gosh, she was just so gifted with sketch art, anything that she touched. It just, it just blew my mind. The level of talent that this girl had at such a young age, um, her father's an artist, you know, some say she gets it naturally from him. But even with her, she had a very different, um, a very different vibe, I would say, because if she were to, to draw something, and I remember just at eight years old, I would look at this portrait that she drew and actually took a picture of her holding it up because I was just so amazed and so proud of her. Um, she was so attentive to details. Like, wow. I've never seen anything like this before. And she was so young, but you could see the movement on a page of the young lady's hair. That's wow. how beautifully detailed she was. You could see the little specks in the eyeballs. You know, Aaliyah was so, so talented, so gifted. And um, here's the thing, she would never, she was so humble, she would never even brag about her artwork. It would always be me and her dad <laughs> just <laughs> gloating on her because, you know, to her, it was just, it was natural to her. And, and she found a lot of comfort in it from the time she could pick up a pencil she was drawn. And um, I remember how she always, always wanted to do something nice for somebody. She was always so sweet. Um, she was always so sweet to me. She wanted to show her mom how much she loved her mom all the time. 
all the time. You know, I, I would play around and I call myself a domestic diva because I love to make food from scratch. I love to know what I'm feeding my kids. That is the way I express and show my love to them is preparing good meals and making sure that I, even though they're, they're very big and can make their plates on their own, I still serve them. That's, That's how I express my love to them. Uh, it's just one of the ways that I express my love to them. Um, but I remember doing something in the kitchen and Aaliyah comes in. She goes, mom, you're such a good mom. She said, <laughs> she says, you work too hard. And she walked out the door. And then I'm like, God, if she only knew why I work so hard, it's always for them. Always for them. Because I have to back up a little bit. Did you hear me say my mother would leave me for months? Absolutely. And I had to be a mother before I was a mother, but I would never want my children to miss me or not, you know, me not be available to them. Right. Absolutely. So I had to go through that in order to be mom to her. And, you know, my other children, I have four children. I remember fast forward a couple of years later, I was in the kitchen again. I'm always, I live in the kitchen, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, unfortunately. And um, she comes in and she says, mom, you should have a show. And what she was talking about was like just me kind of like organizing things, prepping things, helping moms to create things for the home. And I just thought she was the sweetest thing ever because she always wanted to acknowledge me in some way. Right. Okay. Um, July 1st, I take her to work. And normally she would have my car. I taught her how to drive. She's got her license. Um, and I would normally give her my car to go to work. But I had some errands to run like groceries shopping and that sort of thing um so i dropped off at work i picked her up at, after work and she told me that she wanted to go to this block party and um i am originally from new jersey so i'm not familiar with a lot of areas in in maryland now here's the other part i have to back up a little bit because i've been in maryland now 11 years but okay. i'm such a homebody I am such a home. I'm like a hermit. So I'm either at work, at church, home with my kids, rinse and repeat. Same cycle mm -hmm. all the time. Because I've already lived that life. I've already been out there. I've, I've already did all of that. You know what I mean? My, yes. my comfort is here with my, my family. So um, she, um, I picked her up from, from work and she told me she wanted to go to a block party in Brooklyn. And Brooklyn, Maryland is South Baltimore. Um, for people who are unfamiliar. So I remember taking her and a friend who to uh, the movies one time, and her friend lived in Brooklyn Park. Mm -hmm. So when she says Brooklyn Park, I'm thinking, well, she says Brooklyn, I'm thinking Brooklyn Park because that was a suburb area. So if you tell me you're going to a block party, that's kind of what I'm expecting, right? Because I, like I said, I don't know the areas in, in Baltimore. And so... Everything is normal. Everything's the same. My baby, she she gets ready to go out. Um, she ended up taking an Uber out to this block party. She comes in the hallway right by my door. She says, Mom, I'm leaving now. I love you, and I'll see you later. And I said, I love her. I'll see you later. You know, she always give me a hug and a kiss um, before she leaves. And um, my husband and I go to sleep. And, and nothing out of the ordinary until about one o'clock in the morning and I hear my husband screaming so loud. I've never heard him scream like that. I never heard him scream. He doesn't scream, but um, he just screamed no. And being jolted out of your sleep, you know how your heart is like, like jumping out of your chest and I'm yes. trying to figure out what's happening, what's going on. And he's telling me Aaliyah was shot. And I'm like, like that didn't make any sense it was like speaking a whole nother language what do you mean Aaliyah was shot I said Alex Aaliyah wasn't shot that must be somebody else mm -hmm. and he's telling me no they're calling me from her phone so it's Aaliyah's name on his phone someone is calling him from Aaliyah's phone and in hindsight they called my phone twice but I was asleep you know my oh, husband wow. answered his, his phone so I'm frantically up and um, scrambling to, to grab clothes. And at this time, other children hear us, like there's a lot of chaos going on, but they're, they're confused, just as confused as we are, because they're now being woken up as well. And I, 
I, I don't know if it was my husband or myself. One of us said that Aaliyah was shot. And so the kids hear that and they pick it up and they're just as confused as I am. But I'm like, I, I can't talk to you right now. I'm telling the kids, like, I'm, I can't talk to you right now. I've got to get to Aaliyah. Right. Mm -hmm. So we rush out the house and we go to this address that this person on Aaliyah's phone has given us um, the longest 15 minute drive I've ever had in my life. Um, and I'll, I'll be very honest, I'm running lights, I'm running stop signs, I'm beeping my horn, I'm getting to my baby as quickly as I can. Um, and we get there, and the person before we get there on the ride, this person is saying a lot of words. <laughs> wow. And I can't compute anything that they're saying, but they're saying words to my husband. And um, I'm screaming at this person, why don't you just tell me she's okay? So we get on the scene, and there's police tape, there's a bunch of lights, and a bunch of ambulances and I've never seen so many ambulances in my life and I work for a hospital I've never seen this many ambulances in one place and um there was an EMT closing his cab and I'm asking him I'm like is that my daughter in there is she in there um and he says everybody's going to Harbor Hospital go to Harbor okay. Hospital and so run to the car we gotta get to Harbor Hospital that's what they said Aaliyah is so jump back in the car, same deal. Um, beep, 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 get in there as quickly as I can and um, get to Harbor Hospital. It was so much chaos. There were people crying and people hysterical. Um, a lot of people. Wow. And my husband is at the desk and he's asking for Aaliyah Gonzalez. And at this point, I'm on my phone trying to call my aunt and uncle to come to check on my kids because we had ran out of there so quickly. But I'm telling her, too. I said, you know, I, I want to say her name, but I said, um, they, they're telling me Ali was shot, but I know they're lying. I know they're lying. I'm hysterical at this point because I can't even believe I'm saying these kind of words out of my mouth about Aaliyah. Absolutely. So the lady says Aaliyah's not there. And I said, she has to be there. Maybe maybe you didn't register her yet, but mm -hmm. she's got to be here. And um, at this point, my husband is calling Aaliyah's phone back. And the person on the phone is saying, no, sir, Aaliyah's here. She's laying on the ground. So, Wow. Now, we've got to leave Harbor Hospital and go back to the address they originally told us. So now I'm back on the scene. The person that was saying the words that I could not make out, even though I don't know what, I don't know what was happening. The person was saying, no, she's here. She's laying here. I'm sorry. She's dead. That's what they were saying. And, um, wow. By the time, by the time we got back on the scene, at this point, I'm not letting anything stop me at all. I mean, no police, no tape, nothing. Like, I, I need to get to my baby. Huh? And, um, excuse me. Oh, no problem. And um, I almost kicked off my flip-flops because I, 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 I was asleep. I was in my pajamas. I'm, I don't even know what the hell I put on, but there was something to get out the door. And, um... I'm almost glad I didn't because there was so much glass everywhere. Tables turned over. Um, it looked like a war zone. But sure enough, to the left of me, I see a white sheet there. And I see my baby's foot hanging out of the sheet. And I knew that was her because Aaliyah would have called me a long time ago. I knew that was her. So. Wow. I immediately ran over to her and uh, I just screamed from a voice I've never heard in my life. And I can honestly say I, I felt my soul leave my body because I knew I knew that something was wrong and she wouldn't get up. She always listens to me. So. Wow. 
immediately, like I'm inches away, I could pull the sheet off of her and the, the, the police officers grabbed me right away and they're just saying, ma'am, you don't want to see her like this. And I'm telling them, I need her. You don't know I need her. And he said, you don't want to see her like this. They don't know. Wow. So I, um, ooh, you know, I stayed on the scene. My husband and I stayed on the scene. We, and in my head, I'm thinking as I see her and I'm, I'm a logical person. I know what I see. But I still have the thought that Aaliyah is not dead. She's waiting for me. She doesn't know you. She doesn't want you to touch her. She's waiting on her mom because I fixed everything. Right? Yes. I fixed everything for her. And I mean, she had a blister the week before and she asked me if she should pop it. And I told her not to pop it. Just wait till I get home and check it out. And, you know, if there's glass in her foot, if there's anything, she was just my baby, you know. But it was just so permanent. So we could not leave her um, laying on the stairs. And that's the other thing. Just usually was on the stairs. Her back is on the stairs. And again, I'm thinking her back must hurt. Please move her. Wow. Like I said, I know what I see, but it just doesn't make sense. <sighs> We wait till the coroner get there and they did their best to hold up sheets so mm-hmm. my husband and I couldn't see. But um yeah, they put her in the back. I lost it. I really did. I really did. Like she, there's no way she could breathe in that bag. So, wow. This was a year ago. And as you can see, I can tell those details because it plays in my head every day. It is the most horrific thing that any parent could ever experience. Is There's no words for it. And when I say people can't even imagine, I tell people you don't even want to imagine what this is, you know? So... Yeah. And, and and that's 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 when I, we first started this and I and I said this is a sorority and fraternity nobody wants to join. And the thing that that's bothering me more than anything is that this was avoidable. That, that, that it's it's not like you know Leah went went off to war. It wasn't like, you know, she signed up to go fight overseas and fight the enemy or fight anybody. Because, you know, if that happens, the possibility of that getting that call or that knock on the door, it's, it's that's what she signed up for. Mm-hmm. She didn't sign up to go to a block party to enjoy herself with friends and mm-hmm. end up in this situation. Right. And this is what I said in the beginning you are a mother who did everything humanly possible to take care of your babies. And they're always going to be your babies. The thing is, you can be 90 years old and they're 70 years old. They're still going to be your baby. And you're always going to care about them. You're always going to be, that's, they're a part of you. And to know that you had no control, there's nothing you could do. Nothing do would this. change it. Nothing would change that. There was Everything was out. Believe me, if I had control, this wouldn't have happened. This wouldn't have been a part of our life. She would still be here, you know. Um, But that's the hardest thing is, like, this is completely out of your control. And and that's why I need people to understand, because there's no coming back from this. Mm -hmm. So with this gunplay, this crazy ignorance is out there, you leave people behind with questions they can never get the answer to. That's right. That's right. Um, and it's not fair because we have a young lady who was just starting her life, just starting her, her journey to get to where she needs to get to. Doing all the right things, 
great in school, artistic, loving kid, never had to bail him out or anything, just a part of you, and it gets snatched away because of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Because there's no other way to describe it. It's ignorance and, and people not doing their jobs. Because there's no way, because I read a little bit on the story, there's yeah. no way a cop, cops should not have been there. They should have been there. Right. And they hear that, oh, people kept calling and calling and, and yeah. you know, oh, yeah, they, we're going to get there. Yeah. And you know what's going on out there. You know this kid's walk around. Kids, mind you. Let yes. me let me make it clear to you guys. This wasn't a grown-ass 50-year-old dude or 40-year-old dude. This was a group. Yes. This was a kid. These were kids. All, a, so we come to find out later, because I had no details other than the complete and utter devastation, but there were 30 people shot that day. 30 people at this black party. Two people passed away, Aaliyah being one of them, and then a 20-year-old young young man. 30 people shot. So there are 28 others who survived, but some of them have serious injuries. Half of them, more than half of the victims were children under the age of 18. So we have reports of residents talking to me about what happened and they just said miss crystal i just saw bodies dropping it was bodies everywhere there's pure devastation um and these were young people who were shooting in in the party young people were the victims and young people are the perpetrators and um it's just awful i mean it was so bad that some of the emts they they even quit because it, wow. was, it was just a horrific thing to to witness and be a part of in me. Yeah. Oh my God. And again, people think it, oh, it's just people being violent. It's, you know, it's just this over here and this over there. No, people, it's happening all over. Mm -hmm. And there are kids killing kids. They're not adults doing it. This is kids. And if you don't think for one second, it's our society, how we raising our kids, all kids, not just again, we're talking. Miss Crystal is raising her kids properly. There's another parent, same parent, different parent, have a kid, don't care. Kid out there willy-nilly selling drugs, doing what they gotta do. And what happens in the end? A kid that's going places, got a future, gets taken down by somebody who wasn't taught right for wrong or should know right for wrong. Because the other thing, Miss Chris, why I don't want to hear what you hear a lot. Oh, they're kids. You know, they don't know no better and all that. No, you uh, should, no, I don't go for that shit. I don't go for kids because don't know. Then you have um, here in Maryland, you have um, Secretary Giraldi saying that um, he's part of DJS. He's the um, Secretary of um, Department of uh, Juvenile Services. Um, young people brains aren't fully developed until 25 and so you, you see these young people committing crimes and being released caught and released caught and released. uh two of the boys who are in custody right now for the shooting were wearing ankle monitors at this block party um he had a previous gun charge and then you put an ankle monitor on them for them to be out at his block party for hours there was no dings beans whistles nothing to alert authorities about his whereabouts. So, you know, we have that component. And then I talk about this argument about young people, brain development, and that sort of thing. How far are we going to take that theory? Because you can be young and decide to have sex and have children. Huh? Are you going to take their babies away? You can be 18, sign up to defend your country. Are you going to take their guns away? But when someone commits a violent crime, suddenly, all of a sudden, he don't know any better. Oh, His brain is on. not developed until 25. But you can also purchase a home and sign legal documents at 18. Right? Yes, you sure so can. We can't, we, we can't play around with that theory because it doesn't apply. You know, and, and here's another thing my husband would say. Murder is murder. There's no such thing as a juvenile murder. Never heard of it. No, no, because again, I don't want people to keep using the excuse of, oh, you know, there's you know, the music and all that. Because let me say this, as we both know, 
I grew up when NWA came out. I grew up mm-hmm. in the start of this crap when when the gangster rap first started. Right. I didn't at that point say, you know what? They're talking about guns and drugs and shooting people and all that stuff. That's what I want to do. I want to mm-hmm. go out there and shoot people and, and shoot the next inner or to shoot that person. No, because mm-hmm. I said, okay, first of all, this is not entertaining. The music, the beat got me, but it's, mm-hmm. that's the, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sell drugs. I'm not going to go shoot somebody because there's repercussions for that. Yeah. And I was 21 years old when that happened. I was, my brain wasn't fully developed, but mm-hmm. I knew at that point I couldn't go out there and start shooting people, no. selling drugs. And then when somebody comes to me like, oh, you know, I was young. I had a bad upbringing. Make excuses for it. No, 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 mm-hmm. I, no. There's a lot of people who were raised in very bad situations. Right. who turn to be very good people. Yeah. So you can't use that as a cop out. So I don't know what Maryland's doing, but they need to be something different because we can't keep putting these kids out here, these murderers out here, and then say, oh, we got an ankle break, break, bracelet on them, but we can't track them. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't uh, you don't go over and make sure that they're where they're supposed to be, because mm-hmm. again, you're putting them out there, and once they shoot, they continue to shoot because now they I got away with it, so I can continue to go out there and cause yeah. havoc in the streets. You develop an appetite for it. This is what any crime. That's what anything it is that you do. The moment you get a taste for it, you develop out. And 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 I'll tell you this, you know. We always have this term, practice makes perfect. So each and every time they commit a crime, they get better and better and better at it. You know, and so the two people, and I'll go back there, who had ankle monitors on, had gun charges already. So the next crime they commit is even better because now it results in actual homicide and actual, um, you know, there were other people who were out there. So whoever else had a gun started shooting. So now there's these cluster shootings that are happening in this, this area. Yeah. It was, that is absolutely crazy. And again, I'm sorry you had to even go through anything as crazy as that. Because again, your daughter was out there causing problems. She was trying to go out there and enjoy. Again, hate to keep going back, but when we were out there, we were having fun. Nobody was thinking about shooting nobody. I never even thought of bringing a gun to anything. But to see that these people, quote, fun is bringing a gun to anywhere is telling you we have gone horribly wrong in this society in the past 40 years because, as you said, that the crack, I said it back then, I said at some point this crack epidemic is going to cause a long-term repercussions that I don't know where we're going to be, but it's not going to be good. And here we are. We, we're here with these kids who are now having kids, who are now not raising them because if their mom are not raising them and they're not raising their kids, so you just continuing that generational curse, that generational trauma, that generational madness. And it, it's, it's got to stop. And it's sad because you are now, you're now, you have to move forward. And that's the hardest thing people feel to realize is when, that, when this is laid in front of you, you have to ask yourself, what do I do now? How, how do I take this, this, this broken crystal and do something with it because it's not going to be, it's no longer the crystal used to be. I have to take this and mold it to something else that one, I can now move forward and take care of my other babies. And two, make sure you honor Aaliyah for her dreams that were cut short because of somebody else's bullshit. That's right. This is a thing that most people don't, no, especially if you haven't been touched by this kind. I mean, this grief is very different. It is a, um, it is the most profound physical pain that any human being could ever experience. And this is a medically proven and it's taught in all of the um, medical schools. Because here's the thing, your body and your mind does not differentiate between emotional pain and physical pain. So when we have this this kind of trauma come into your life and I'm not eating. It's not because I don't want to eat, but there's a physical pain there that you, you just can't, you just can't. And what people don't understand, and, and I, can, I can say this to you because I feel like you, you would appreciate this, but we say oftentimes you be careful who you sleep with because there's body memory there, right? And you mm-hmm. want to make sure. But what happens when you hold a child in your womb? 
and you nurse your baby and suddenly someone snatches your baby. There's body memory there, right? So it's not that you don't want to, you have this physical pain that won't go away. I mean, it'll eventually ease up, but then you are also not just mourning your child's transition, but you are mourning who you were before this happened. The carefree, the, 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 always smiley the always i'm so happy to see you the uh, i think that was my biggest fear when i was returning to work because i'm always greeting people you know your wife would tell you like Mm -hmm. i'm always so happy to see you and i was so afraid that i would lose that that i didn't lose it and i thank god for it yes definitely and and the other thing is and people always say is when you go and do death it's like oh you know time heals no Time doesn't heal. What mm-hmm. happens is it becomes a new normal. Mm-hmm. And I always say this, of like appreciate everything and everyone you have at that moment, because if you live long enough, mm-hmm. you'll start to outlive a lot of people that you grew up with. And you just speak, that becomes your new normal. Yeah. Every, every time. And then as you go along, you just have to change and evolve, but it's still a loss. It, it doesn't matter. You know, 15, 20 years from now, it's still a loss. It's still a life that wasn't led. It wasn't left life that was lived fully. Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. So when you're picking up a gun, people out there, understand there's lives, there's a ripple effect. So when you're out there shooting willy-nilly at people and you miss the person, the target, hit some kid or hit somebody else, there's a ripple effect associated with that. Mm-hmm. And you may not care, but that that family now has to live with your bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And we have too many, too many mothers and fathers nowadays, every day. I wish I could say every once in a while, you know, or, you know, maybe every couple of months, but no, it's every day. There's Mm -hmm. a kid, there's a, there's someone's daughter, husband, father, sister, who gets removed unalived because of bad decisions because you can't be man or woman enough to sell mm-hmm. stuff the old fashioned way. Get into a fist fight or, or have a fist fight and, and at least be able to fight another day. But when you pull that gun out, there is no another day. You're you took somebody out and now you're in jail forever. And your life is over. Mm-hmm. Done. And to, to hear the story, it's like I'm there because again, I can imagine where my head would be. I'd be out. The anger I would have would be so telling that it was like it, it would it would change me. I would have to walk away for a little bit. I would have to walk away because that changes a bit. That changes how I deal with people. Changes how I deal with situations because now I was that good guy, that good person, and you changed me. You change you you change who I am. The essence of who I am. I was in, I was, excuse my expression, I wasn't fuck with nobody. All I was trying to do is take care of my kids, take care of my family, live my life, and, and wish everyone well. But the, but it took you and, and, and the devil within you to change my life. No one has that ability or should not have that choice to do that. Yes, so right. when they and get you, know, and when they get you. you just walked in that park, I didn't mean to, to come. No, no. But since you just walked in, if you see me looking this way, my husband is here and everything you just expressed. And this hasn't even touched you. But that's what I mean when I talk about the unfair place that we put our kings. Because you force him to restrain himself because, yes, there is anger there. But Mm -hmm. now here's the thing, especially if you are a responsible man who has a wife and other children, you cannot retaliate. No, you can it, it, as painful as it is, if someone took your baby, right? So these mm-hmm. are the places that we are forcing our kings to be in a in a weaker, in a weakening state, you know, because like you said, you just changed the very fabric of my being. Yes, you have. Not because I wanted to, you force me to. And I always go back to I never want no one should be able to control my emotions. I should be able to control my, my emotions fully. No one should be able to say yeah. anything to me, do anything to me. But by you doing that, you touching the essence of who I am. You, because basically you touch me. That, that's not a car, not a house, not some clothes. 
that's me. That's the, the time, the money, the effort, the, the knowledge I put into this, this soul yes. to carry forward. Yes. And you took, you robbed me of that. Mm-hmm. You robbed me of that for what? Because you got angry, you got you got a little mad at somebody. Somebody pulled a guy. I got a bigger gun. That means shit. That doesn't mean a goddamn thing in the world. Because then your ass will go to jail, and you'll be in there for ten, well, twenty, thirty for life, right. and then your life is over. But you still breathing. You still existing. May not you're not existing in the world per se. You are existing in your hopefully your own hell. Yeah. But then you don't put me in a hell. And now I have to take that anger, I have to take mm-hmm. that hell, I have to take that emotion, I have to mm-hmm. take all that anger and convert it to something positive. Mm. Say that. Say I, that. I have to convert it. I have to, I have to take that hate and convert it because I still have other kids. I still have to live. I have to be there for them. I have to be there as a man. I have to be there for my wife who I... I couldn't even imagine her pain because she had the baby. I can't imagine what she's going through. But then simultaneously, I have to be able to heal myself. So I'm giving her support and not mm-hmm. wanting to just go and shoot up the block my damn self at that point, which again, relieves the stress. But now I've now spread that poison, that hate, that That's anger. Right. And that is what people. this is breeding. It is giving, you know, eventually it is going to start to develop Um, regular, normal ass people to become vigilantes and take the law into their own hands because the criminal justice system, they ain't doing it. You know, these kids are coming in and out, in and out, in and out like clockwork. And so now, even with stepping outside of your door, just regular, normal activity, you know, if you drive into the city at any point, there's squeegee boys approaching your car now that we know that you will shoot and kill someone. Now we almost feel like we got to give you money just so we can live and get through this light. Exactly. Isn't that crazy? That's absolutely crazy. Mm-hmm. And, and you allow these kids, because again, Miss Crystal, the, squee- the squeegee boys have been there forever. It ain't mm-hmm. like they just started last week. I remember when I was in my 20s and the squeegee boys were out there. Yeah. So we had, we, we've seen as an issue but nobody's solving it. Why are these kids out there doing using squeegees anyway? Why are they not in school? Mm-hmm. Where are their parents? Where's their father? Where's their mama? But again, it's so easy to build more prisons than to say, you know what? Our school systems suck. Mm-hmm. We obviously got to start from scratch. We need to redo this. We need to take the 21st way, 21st century way of, of doing schooling because it's not working. And all you're doing is you're breeding criminals. Mm-hmm. You're breeding them because if you're not in school, they're going to get in trouble. They're out there hanging with the other kids they ain't in school mm-hmm. the parents ain't on the mama more than likely ain't t- paying attention to him and if he's out there selling drugs miss crystal she's not gonna say much because he brings some money to the house yeah so you're breeding that and so you're wondering like hmm how does this end they don't care they say oh build more prisons we put more prisons and I don't and they don't understand oh they probably do understand it's more cheaper to get these kids into some sort of training and some sort of uh classes to handle their emotions and anger management, then put them in prison. Yes. Well, that's if, like you said, they wanted to fix the problem. But see, murder and crime is big business from top to bottom. And so the only justification for receiving federal funds, federal money, because even the school systems, if they wanted to teach the children and put that into their curriculum, they can, but they mm-hmm. won't. Because what they're doing now is is, is not only breeding uh, criminals, but even with literacy. And I have to say this, and it, it has to be said in a way that is very respectful because I, the children deserve so much better. You know, yes. these kids are not even passing um, proficiency tests. They can't read or write. They're li- like legally illiterate. So wow. you expect a healthy mind to come from that environment where they're not even getting the proper education or none of that. But the school system has millions of dollars being poured into the system. You have wow. a fee rate of 58%. So more than half of your school is not in school and no one is going into the homes and finding out resources and finding out what's going on with this. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody's doing it. Nobody's doing it. So wow. when you talk about um, fixing, there's no fixing. 
You know why? Because there's a lot of money in this in this um in this in the city. I'm I'm just say that there's a lot of money there. And you, same thing with the ankle monitors. I talk about having our children leave school with a trade or skill set so that they can become productive citizens. So instead of selling drugs, they are actual entrepreneurs and enterprising and building up the city. That's why I have redirecting our culture, which is my nonprofit. And we'll talk about that, but um, putting leaders back in place, but you got to breed leaders. You can't breed criminals. No. Right. No, you can't. And everything you've been doing has proven to not be effective because, again, I have to go back to that statistic. We are 200 percent up in crime for juvenile um, crime than we were last year, this year. 200 percent up. So something is not working. Yeah. No, no. And, and that's the problem, because, again, it, people don't understand the ripple effect. Oh, uh, we, we don't worry about that. You know, we catch it down the road. What a ripple effect is. These kids just grow up horribly, don't have any role models, school ain't there, church ain't there, mom ain't there, daddy ain't there. So then the streets teach them. And st yeah. streets are always going to win. In the end, the streets always win. You always lose. And, and in the end, to, we have to also talk about that ripple effect when it comes to the actual criminals or perpetrators, because, again, it's learned behavior. Most of their fathers have been murdered or their brothers and sisters or their, you know, mamas. Most of them have been, and this is a part of life. I have to go back. I have to go back to 30 people shot, two people passed, 28 are living, and some of them have serious injuries. I am the only one that's speaking out about Brooklyn Day still. Reason being because we're not from the community. This is not normal for me. This is not, I'm not conditioned to believe that this is a way of life. And seeing the city of Baltimore is a way of life, right? And yeah. it's not their fault. They don't even know that it's conditioning. They don't. they don't even know because it's generationally passed down that this is the way it is. And who's going to care about us? You just hit it on the head. Mm -hmm. If you take hope away from a kid, any person, period, if you take a hope away from them, you now have a walking, talking yes. ministry to society because to them, nobody cares about me. Nobody so I shouldn't care about them. Mm -hmm. So anything I do to them, I'm just trying to get over. I'm just trying to survive. I, how many times I've, I heard that? I'm just trying to get over and survive. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to exist in, in, this, in this concrete jungle. So yeah. what I do is what I do. Mm -hmm. If they gave me something else to do, maybe I'd do something different. But you've already hardened them to a point where mm -hmm. now you set them up for not being to find jobs. You're going to have them having a bunch of babies that they're not taking care of. You're going to have a bunch of mothers who now have to use the system because it's not like they're going to pay child support. They're going to be there to marry them and they're going to take right. care of them. So now you have set this whole dysfunctional system that you want these people to survive from and yeah. thrive from. Yeah. Yeah. I'll share this story with you and I, I've, I've shared it with Governor Westmore and, and a few others. Um, here I am showing up to um, elementary middle school that's directly across the street from where my baby was shot, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to meet with the counselor because I'm my whole push has been to get gun violence, um, gun violence prevention education programs into the schools. We, like I said, you got to teach people how to be good, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we don't have that in a country that, like you said before, statistically between the ages of one and 19, and I'll go even further, between the ages of one and 25, that's the that's the number one in twenty five gun violence is the number one killer, is the number one cause wow. of death. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to the schools and I've been to superintendents and all that, but this is one of my first meetings. Um, now keep in mind this is directly across the street. They just suffered a mass shooting. That's what they want to call it. It's a mass shooting because um, there's so many involved, right? So mm -hmm. categorize it as mass shooting. And I'll get back to that term in just a minute. But um, I'm willing myself to get out of this car because I'm right back at the scene. That was so traumatizing. And I'm saying, God, you brought me here. You got to get me out this car. Mm -hmm. Finally get out the car and I start to make my way to the front door. And there are three police cars. Lights are on. And I don't think much of it because I don't know what their daily operations are like. They just had a mass shooting just a couple months ago. You know, so, 
and I ring the buzzer and I get on the intercom, the door is open. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> so I walk in. But as I'm walking in, and again, this is a elementary middle school, I have to emphasize that. So this is pre-K to eighth grade, but I can't for the life of me figure out why the school is so eerily quiet. So I go into the front office and immediately I get this, the feeling of I don't give a damn when I walked into the office. So you have three staffers, um, they have hoodies on, they got the scully caps on and da, da, da. and I'm like, in my head, I'm like, this is the model that our children see when they come through the door. You know, we used to have a dress code in the school mm-hmm. system. We used to have teachers who cared about what they look like when they present themselves. Right. But, mm-hmm. you know, I don't I don't want to I'm having a moment. So <laughs> I'm waiting on um, counselor to come downstairs because I finally tell him I'm here to see such and such. And um, they were surprised to know that I was coming in. So she comes downstairs to greet me and she says, Miss Gonzalez, what a coincidence. The very reason why you're here today, we're on an active lockdown right now. So Malcolm, I have to back up because I want to see if you caught anything before I even go further. Oh, yeah, I caught all that. It's like, first of all, why you? Why were you able to walk in the school? That, that's it. That, a, a that, is the, that is the key takeaway. The door is open, and I'm in an active lockdown, and I'm able to, without any identification, walk into a school full of children during an active lockdown. Before I even knew they were on an active lockdown, I already told you I got that sense of I don't give a damn. I don't even know why I'm here. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Feeling. So our children are in a dark, locked classroom. My whole meeting was in a dark, locked classroom. So these children just suffered a traumatic event. So much so that they tell the counselor that I'm, I'm meeting with, you know, we were hiding in our bathtub. We were hiding behind the bushes. We were, these are babies. These are babies. Elementary, middle. And so fast forward, present day, they're still being traumatized with the threat of a student in the school with a, uh, with a gun. Wow. And you expect a healthy mind to come from that environment. This, this is what we live with. This is what we live with. Our children are going to school. Under hiding under a desk because this is not a drill. This is real. This is an active lockdown. And you know, mm. you just just describe Crystal. You just describe a third world country. These kids in Iraq and Iran and Syria and all these other places that go through this every day. That's just okay. how they live. And you're talking about in the greatest country and in the, the greatest world. Country. And I'm so glad you said that because I was holding that back. This is something that my husband says all the time. If you were to go to a third world country and a child has a bomb strapped to his chest or is walking around the street with an AK-47, what would you consider them to be? A terrorist, yes? Yes. But here on American soil, we call it juvenile crime. (laughs) It's convenient. Because it's fluffy and it's nice. We call it juvenile crime. And these kids are growing up to be killers. Mm -hmm. Not juvenile, because... They do grow up. That's the one thing they, I, I guess they fail to realize that they don't care. That these little kids that grow up to kill people yeah. who grow up and become adult killers. Right. So now you basically, you have assassins that will do anything, kill anybody because they've killed before. They killed when they were 10. They killed when they were 14. Mm-hmm. And you raise them. And the, and the sad thing, Chris, was not just in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. It's, in, it's in Detroit. It's Mm -hmm. in Chicago, it's in Los Angeles, Atlanta, Houston, all all the big places and even the little places. Because, again, that's what you're raising. But yet Mm -hmm. nobody wants to pay attention to that. Oh, oh, we just have thoughts and prayers. No, no, no. We need action. If not, and the only thing, the saddest thing, I'm going to say this, but don't even care. It seems like the only way someone will really care if one of their kids gets shot. That's right. And and that is... That is the most unfortunate. But here's the thing I would say to that, too. And I've said this to many of the legislators at the rate that we're going. It's not a matter of when it's not a matter of if it's going to happen to you. It's a matter of when, because it will happen to you. 
I would have never thought this would be brought to my doorstep. I was the same mother that would watch it on TV and say, my heart goes out to that mother, you know, because we would never put ourselves in those positions. You don't have to be put in any position. Here's the thing. If you raise your children with morals, values, and they have all, you have all of the things, the tools in place, guess what? They still have to go out and co-mingle with the world. Absolutely. You can put them in a bubble, yeah. but they still have to live in a greater world. Yeah. And if the greater world becomes as tarnished as it's currently being tarnished, then what do you do? Because you still have to interact with them. Again, you have to pass them. You have to, you know, you see them. And now they look at you. You're trying to live your life the best way you can. You look at you as an easy target. It's a, it's a, oh, I know they got money based, based on how you dress. It's sad because mm -hmm. you can't even dress the way you used to anymore. Mm -hmm. Because if you have jewelry or anything on, they think you may have money. That's so you got to right. dress down or, or not put jewelry on and that kind of stuff. And that's sad. Because that's the mentality that we're raising now. It really is sad, but guess what? We're the only ones that do it. So now mm. I want to introduce and go back to the mass shooting term, right? Mm -hmm. Because this wasn't a typical mass shooting. This isn't some random white guy going into a movie theater. This isn't some random white guy going into a church or a school or anything like that. This right here was us killing us. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what this was. And so it only happens with us. And I think about that self-hatred that has been passed down, because here's the other thing. You're not going to find any other cultures doing this. They have their own problems. But when it comes to wiping each other out and seeing and that I can walk past you and not even acknowledge you or I can, you know what I'm saying? I look mm -hmm. at you and I hate you for no reason. As a matter of fact, this is the code. You do not post your location on social media until you've already left. Yes. Because people are watching you in your chain and they will come in there and shoot and kill you and rob you. And how sad is that? Yeah. Come on. I mean, yeah. you, you're now raising us. We are now saying we have to be kind of like our own vigilante to protect ourselves because we don't know what's out here. We don't know who we're walking up to. Who It could be a gang initiation. It could be just some guy who, or high on us or uh, mm -hmm. Beth or anything again so now we're uncomfortable walking around our own mm -hmm. when did I ever think the day did our ancestors ever think of the day that we will be uncomfortable walking around our own people when, mm -hmm. I, when you know how hard they worked to get what they got right. and we are literally just as a community pissing it away yeah. we are literally just, just saying oh yeah we, but that's when y'all was that's y'all that ain't mm -hmm. us but mm -hmm. now you, you don't realize you're about to be put into another plantation, mm -hmm. a prison plantation. That's because right. once you start to you know, put you where, we know where you are. You ain't going there. Mm -hmm. You ain't leaving there. So now what do you think that happens to the greater, our greater community? The women suffer. The kids suffer. We, we become a fractured, dysfunctional mm -hmm. unit as a whole. And that's not yeah. well for the future. Because we have kids who are, we hope grow up, marry somebody decent, get married. You know, mm -hmm. live a nice, healthy life. But these bad decisions that's happening now is is killing us. And and it's putting mm -hmm. mothers like you in this position mm -hmm. where I have to now live a new normal because of what you guys did to me. Mm -hmm. Not like you raised a killer. I thought, oh, you know what? She shot four or five people. I don't know what happened. I don't know what we're wrong. You know, I, I tried my best. Then you were never home. And you were always out. She was always living on her own. Then you can say, oh, you can't use no excuses because you This you was the very first time Aaliyah was ever out that late, ever. She always had a curfew. But here's the thing. She did everything that her dad and I asked her to do and more. She was an 18-year-old young woman who just graduated high school three weeks earlier. So I even at, when she passed, I said, baby, you did nothing wrong. Because I felt like it was important for me to tell her that you did nothing wrong. Absolutely. You know, um, this is 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 really crazy that she, the one time she went out, she lost her life. To say that the one time that she was out, she lost her life. Yeah. That is. Yeah. It, it it hits you like cold water. That's mm -hmm. the reality. She was she wasn't out there. She was out there to enjoy herself, to say, hey, I'm getting out of school. I'm going moving forward. And then this happens. And as you say, it can happen to anybody. It's not like Aaliyah's not the only person. It's happened all the time. It just happens to hit you. Mm 
and it forced you to now do something different. That's right. And, and now follow That's now you in your own walk where you have to do this. And you, this is a walk you're going to do until That's you right. have to, because you have other babies. You don't want this to happen to you. You mm-hmm. got other people, other kids, you know, you don't want this to happen to. Mm-hmm. So it's like, we at least have to say, honor what we need to do. If you can right. sit around and say, Oh, it's somebody else. No, that somebody else becomes you. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing is having this conversation about, listen, it's a lot of things we have to, to overcome, a lot of things we do, but you put us in this position where we have to do this. I yeah. have to do this. You breathe this. It's it's a part, it's it's a part of your, your skin. It's your that's cloak right. that you have that's to wear. Right. You know, that's and that's 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 to see you a year here is amazing. It tells you your faith, it tells you the, the strength that you have as a as a woman, mm-hmm. as a mother, as a warrior. That's that tells you who you are. Thank you. I was and, so I share with you, I knew right away on the scene over Aaliyah. I said, God, you got to show me what this is for. Because for her to go, ooh, you got to show me what this is for. And I know you need her. <laughs> I, um, I don't want to be selfish. I need her too. But you got to show me what this is for. And I started getting a few revelations, you know, because when people say, you know, don't question God, it's the biggest bull crap I ever heard in my <laughs> life. You because have he to. expects you to question him. You're not going to know, you know, and I still don't know. But what I do know is I'm not comfortable with this. And I do know that it's not this surface stuff that we're talking about that we saw a Brooklyn day. I knew I had to look at it with a wider lens. And we talked about all of these issues tonight, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. if we just sur- focused on the surface stuff, you say, oh, there was uh, some little black boy shot up a block party. Boom. That's it. No. So then you have the factor of police officers not being present, even though there were hundreds of calls going out saying that there are people out here with guns and knives. And they're present 26 years prior to this occasion. So now I got to fight the police officers. Now I got to fight. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, this should have never happened. It shouldn't have happened. And so now we have police officers responding after the shooting and making statements saying, uh, by the time we got here, the incident had already occurred. Well, judging by the hundreds of calls that were going out, this incident should have never occurred. So now instead of being proactive, you're just being reactive. And now I am here and I'm all the way here. Oh, you're all in now. You're all in. And and, and you have to be because, again, nobody, you want nobody to go through what you went through. Nobody should go through what you went through and what a lot of people go through. And particularly you, I know you. Mm -hmm. And I know how hard you work for these babies. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why I had to have you on. And I want you to talk about your nonprofit. I want people to know about your nonprofit. And let me just say this, people, um, before she gets into it. We're going to be working very close. So I've mm-hmm. done this particular this first one with uh, Crystal, but this is an ongoing thing. We're going to have a lot more discussions about a lot. And I may even set aside just for her or some other things happen. So this is not a one and done. But I want to show you if this young lady can overcome what she's done, Use dag on sugar, Ken. And she started her nonprofit. So go ahead and tell the people about your nonprofit. Yes. Yeah, so our nonprofit is called Redirecting Our Culture. I'm wearing one of our shirts today. Um, redirecting our culture is um the first of all, let me go back to the word redirect. I have to say this because everything kept going back to you gotta redirect, right? Um when Aaliyah was shot. I had no idea who the hell I was, what I was supposed to, what am I supposed to do? Like my baby is gone. How am I supposed to live? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I kept hearing you, you got to change with the change. You've got to pivot. You, you've got to do something. Right. Cause Mm -hmm. everything is different. You are not in the same life that you were just 24 hours ago. And this, this wasn't an overnight thing, you know, um, Mm -hmm. Believe me, you cannot think. You cannot think straight. And I still have a ton of brain fog even a year later. Um, But then I really started redirect when I 
again, looked at it at a wider lens and I said, oh my God, we have got to redirect where our young people are going, where our culture is going because it's filled with nothing but death and destruction, right? Mm -hmm. And we've got to get away from glorifying the drugs, the the music, the the Cardi B's and the Meg Thee Stallions with the liquor being poured down her throat and the, you know, the glorification of the guns, all, all of those things that are killing us, mm -hmm. right? There used to be a time where we cared about what we looked like before we went outside, you know? And I'm just like, well, what happened there? And so... Mm -hmm. We've got to restore principles of respect, pride, and dignity back into our people so that we're building up character, so that we're building up integrity. Again, we are showing people what it looks like to do right. Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy to do wrong. But you know what I'm saying? When you, when you start to create crime, and I say this all the time, you don't break the law. You think you break the law. What you do is you create a new law. So, for instance, if you think you're going to go out and rob and steal and sell drugs, you thought you was breaking the law. But what happens now is now you've created high blood pressure, restrictive blood vessels. You've created stress. You're looking over your shoulders. You're watching your back. That's the new law you created for yourself. Absolutely. Right? But people don't realize that. So when you think you're breaking the law, the law is actually breaking you. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, <laughs> we're redirecting our culture. This is what we aim to do. And we are, um, we're raising people up. We're building people up. That's it. And I want to make sure that we are putting things in place for our young black folks to be enterprising, right? To mm -hmm. be entrepreneurs, to build up their city, to have pride in their community. You know, if you see nothing but glass and dirt and debris right outside your front door, you know, that's that that breeds a negative mindset. But if yep. you just took care, <laughs> took care of your place, you know, did something in the community, clean it up. Let's go. Because at the end of the day, we've got to do so much more. And I know like um, I know that people will say that um, it's such a big problem when I talk about the music industries and I talk about what, and you may reference it to David and Goliath. Right. Mm -hmm. like we, uh, people would say, you know, oh, the music industry is too big to fight. And I'm on the other hand, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm saying he's too big to miss. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Too big to miss. So we are we are we are doing some amazing things with redirecting our culture. You can go on to redirectingourculture.org and find out more about the organization, what we have to offer. Leave your contact there so that you can get our email list and and that sort of thing. And we do have some merchandise. So our clothing is not so much about the clothing, but the clothing makes a statement, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about wearing other people's brand, why don't we, why don't you wear a brand that actually makes a statement in what it is that you're doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, and, and hey, by the way, people, <laughs> I got my smiles on. I yes. got my, my shirt on today because like I got support. I have to support. I, Thank you. We, we together, it's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, this problem didn't happen overnight, but at least we're going to be part of the solution. Yeah. Um, steadfast, ten, using the old term, ten toes down. We got to stand for something or, yeah. or fall for anything, mm. you know. And like I said, this I had to have you as my first guest on this podcast. And again, people, she's gonna be coming back because I'm gonna talk <laughs> with her about some other things and bring talk about bring some other people on board. But again, please, Thank you. please, 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 um, we're gonna also put this on the very bottom of the podcast so you'll be able to reach. All your stuff, your your yeah. uh, OG, your um, IG, um, mm -hmm. Facebook, website, all that stuff. Donate all that stuff because again, um, I'm gonna say this: you are the epitome of overcome to become. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that most people will still be sitting somewhere in a corner mm -hmm. trying to bounce back from, and. Some will, most won't. Yeah. But you're like, you know what? You have made, you have now made me. I have to put an army together to fight you. Yeah. And the army may be small now, but it's going to grow because we're not talking about just 
BS stuff we're talking about. We don't want anybody else to go through this. And we want our next generation to be better. Right. It has to be better. It has to be better. And I, I knew um, right away, you know, and it, it has to do with my faith and spirituality. I knew that there is no such thing as death once I could finally sit down and process this thing. So um, I knew Aaliyah was just without a body at this moment. And there's a separation there, right? So that Mm -hmm. knowledge has helped me to move forward. And the fact that I know that she is safe, right? Used to be a time right after, especially right after I'm her mother. Of course, I said this. I would say all the time, I just want her back. My husband would say all the time, I just want her back. And then I said one day, I said, you know what? It, It would be selfish of me to want her back. Look what the world did to her, you know? And so making sure that she is tucked and she's safe because here I had to worry about her, right? Yeah. Um, that has helped me to move through this. Um, one of the biggest things that I focus on and I feel like it's important for me to just share, I know everybody does things their own way. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been through my busyness, through my um, getting legislation passed, um, because of this shooting, that was important to me, showing the world who Aaliyah was outside of the tragedy. Because when this happened, everybody heard about the shooting, but nobody knew about my baby. And I think sharing her with the world, that has been so uh, beneficial to me in my process, right? Um, Absolutely. Gotten scholarships in her name. So not only, yeah, not only um, is she, she, am I honoring her in that way, but her legacy, it carries on into someone's education and hopefully that will carry on and carry on and carry on. So I'm very, very um, blessed with knowing that the best way I can handle this is to honor her in everything it is that I do. And so the one year commemoration of the shooting. So I can't celebrate um, a death date, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, July 2nd was the day of the shooting. So this year, July 2nd, this entire year has been full of tears. Um, mm-hmm. There, I did not want that this day. I mean, we were experiencing the first of everything. So everything was just devastating. Um, July 2nd, what I can celebrate though, is her ascension. You know, absolutely she's in her best form right now. She's in her best form. And um, to us, our new year doesn't reset on a January 1st. Our new year resets on July 2nd because our whole entire life flipped on its axis, right? So yes. July 2nd, I did a celebration of life for Aaliyah. Um, it was a festival. So we brought the community out to show oh, people great. what it really looks like to come together in love and unity. And we had the basketball tournaments, there was double Dutch competitions. Oh, wow. There vendors, there were food trucks. It was such a beautiful atmosphere. We had the police, um, and I'm in Anne Arundel County, mm-hmm. um, the police commissioner there, fire trucks there, things for the kids. It was such a great event um, and had tons of news coverage, which was nice. Um, mm-hmm. But just to see people come out for us, and celebration, it, this is the way that we want to see our community come together. So with that being said, it will be an annual event okay. um, in honor of Aaliyah. And um, from that event, I am going to be receiving um, a prestigious Fannie Lou Hamer oh, award for, for outstanding public service. Um, and I tell you, this is not ever anything that I sought out for but and I was completely shocked because people keep saying you you've done a lot in a year to me that was the only way I could cope with what has happened absolutely you know absolutely I mean and and you know we both know Aaliyah is right there the spirit is in you (laughs) she she, (laughs) see right behind it it, beautiful young lady it's just again tragic but you're overcoming it. And overcoming people isn't just a one day thing. It's a journey. It's it ups and downs, but you just have to one. Faith is putting one foot ahead of the other and not knowing how you're going to end. That's what faith is. And yeah. so again, you know, 
you know, I got you. You know, I, hey, wherever you need, wherever you need, wherever's going on, I'm gonna put it on. The, I'm putting on everything. So again, I'm gonna help you push you to that next level. I'm a behind the scenes guy. I just, I just want to push you out there to get the knowledge out there because they have to know, Chris. I, again, you know, I just, I'm just so impressed that you know you're here, and you're doing so much, and you have a lot more to do. So, you know, and again, you'll be back. I'm going to bring you back. Like, yes. so you, you're the first overcomer, and daggone it, you ain't the last one, but dang, you're the main one. You, you set, be, you set ahead. <laughs> yeah, you set, you have set the standard. So, you know, and again, <laughs> I thank you and I bless you for all thank you're you. doing. And these kids, parents, do, please do better. Please do better. We don't want to, we don't want to keep having these conversations. I, I'd rather have a conversation about kids driving, going to college, getting the trade starting businesses doing great stuff here's the thing if you you need help in any of those areas even if you're struggling with your own tragedies i want you to reach out to me i want you to go on to redirectingourculture.org and send out the contact form with a short message because if you are having problems with your children and don't necessarily have the right tools we're not here to condemn we're here to help and uplift right and so i love I love working with other people. I, I do it all week long, <laughs> all day long. Um, so please reach out to me. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is at is inspire me, K R E E. So it's inspire me Cree. That's my um, nickname. Everybody calls me. So you'll find me there. All right. Great, love. Again, I enjoy this. I wish we had could have a different discussion, but based on what you talked about, <laughs> we are starting the movement. We're starting to change the minds and to start small. You got to have a little mustard seed for a little, just a little oomph to get you to the mm-hmm. next level. And that's what we're doing here, people. We're just starting off showing you there are people who are <laughs> going through horrendous things, but they're thriving and striving. So with that, we're in this new episode of the... Um, overcomers and again people you know what you need to do subscribe hit the button and send me if you can't get in touch with miss crystal send to me i'll make sure i get in touch with miss crystal but I, we want to help you we want you guys to know you're not by yourselves you're not alone and there are still good people out here that's trying to make things better for the future because again if we kill our youth we kill our future and you don't want that to happen so with that peace and blessings y'all